next speaker. Mr. Director of Apologetics for Catholic Answers. He was raised the Southern Baptist and turned to the Assembly of God. He enrolled in Jimmy Swag Bible College, wanted to be a preacher. Spent four years in the Marines where he met someone named Matt Mula. I like talking about that. That would be an interesting conversation. He converted to Catholicism in 1988, where he entered the seminary to become a priest. Best I can read, the last year of seminary school, he discerned that it wasn't for him. I want to invite him. Is doing what he's doing now. But he left the seminary in 1994, where he's gone to be an apologetic apologist. I feel like I know him. I just met him yesterday. We were watching. Not many people know this about Tim, but he's almost a master ping pong player. Give us a warm welcome for Tim Shaker. And that 
that is, number one, I believe there is a lack of a sense of urgency in our Catholic culture, in our Catholic community, and right here in this room, and right here in my heart. There's a lack of a sense of urgency concerning the situation in which we find ourselves. My brothers, we are in warfare. This is not cliche. I'm not just saying this to tickle your ears, guys. We are in warfare. We are in a time of crisis in our culture. Gentlemen, the empire is crumbling. Amen? Amen. We are standing with St. Augustine at the end of his life when he writes the city of God and he sees the writing on the wall of the Roman Empire is coming to a close. And of course, it would take about 45 years after he died before what he saw come and happen. And the collapse of collapses happened. Many thought it would be the end of the world in 476. Gentlemen, we are in a similar, uh, similar situation. And yet, the, the reason why I, I say that I don't think we understand it hasn't hit home with us the sense of urgency of the situation is because when you understand the situation, the urgency of the situation, it changes the way you act. Amen? Amen. It changes what you do tomorrow morning when you understand the crisis. Number one. And number two, the second thing I want to do is to put my foot somewhere. <laughs> And hopefully encourage us, we talked about this yesterday with the, with the guys, in the image of our holy father, Pope Francis, who I love. I wrote a blog about the post on Catholic answer some posts a lot back. Uh, Pope Francis for such a time as this. With all the criticism of, of our holy father and the quotes taken out of context and all the nonsense, I think what folks are, are missing is the call to action that our Holy Father has issued to us, he sees the urgency of the hour. And he's challenging us to get out of our pews, to get out of our comfort zones, go out and preach the gospel with our lives and our words. That's all I want to talk to you about this morning. I'm going to start here, but let's go back in time. I want to go back to June 25th of 1950. At O Dark 30. Now, some of you with a lot more gray hair than I have know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you with no hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking the beginning of the Korean War. As many of you know, there was a massive scale down after World War II, as is often the case. Of course, you can't keep yourself at that high level of military readiness as we had in World War II. And I was reading, uh, I was just finishing up a book, uh, The Name Above the Title by Frank Capra. I recommend it by a great man. Uh, but he, he, he talks about how before he went into World War II, uh, volunteered to go and serve his country, he, he made one last movie that he was hoping was going to be able to give him a good chunk of change to, because he was about to take a big pay cut to go into it. But he, he talked about how the, the movie that he made, Our Saint Old Lace, if you haven't seen it, it's hilarious. Hilarious movie. He said his, his take was $239,000, so he thought, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm set. But the problem was that Uncle Sam took $202,000. you imagine that? $202,000 out of $239,000. So when you complain about high taxes, think about that, right? You can't, see, you, you can't stay at that level. And so, of course, there's a massive scale down after World War II. And unfortunately, we scaled down too much. We were ill-prepared. The buildup was happening. People were saying, you know, that there's something happening over here in Korea. They're going to hit us. And, well, yeah, maybe, maybe, and we weren't ready. We weren't prepared. And as many of you know, when the North came over the 38th parallel, we had fledgling UN troops. And, and, you know, God bless the, I believe it was the, uh, Seventh Army that came over from Japan. What? They were quickly overpowered by the North Korean forces. It was devastating, and they basically took the whole Korean Peninsula down. Pusan, where the, the Pusan perimeter was established, as many of you all know. 
And we're in crisis mode. We got hit, even though we should have known this was coming, we were still unprepared. We were hit, we're in crisis. And it was uh, Doug, General Douglas MacArthur who said that this was the Marine Corps' finest hour. Now, I would respectfully disagree with the good general here. He needs to read a little more Marine Corps history. Hurrah! Oh, hey, that's just me. me. <laughs> Marine Corps had a whole lot of finest hours. But at any rate, he said this was the Marine Corps' finest hours. Many of you know, the Koreans expected that we would land in the south to reinforce the Busan perimeter and move up from there. What actually happened was MacArthur called for the Marines to do what seemed to be impossible then up in Incheon, which was a, a horrid place to land, number one. They didn't expect it. The Marines did the impossible, and I do have to say, it wasn't only the Marines, it was 40,000 Marines that landed, which was the brunt of the uh, force there. But you, you also had the 8th Army, and you had 6,000 rock forces, God bless those guys. Those guys are fighters. But they ended up cutting off the supply run, uh, lines of the Koreans, masterful, decimating the enemy. And, and, and you know, there's something I want you to keep this in mind, gentlemen. Not only did they cut off the supply lines, they were able to then decimate the enemy and then beat our forces coming up from Kusan. They were able to reestablish the 38th parallel. But very important, they also were able to rescue, because when, when the North came over the 38th parallel, there was a rapid retreat southward. And unfortunately, some men and even weapons were left, left behind. Keep that in mind, my brother. There were weapons as well as men that were left behind. And those Marines were able to come in and rescue them, pick up the weapons, as well as their, some of their wounded fallen comrades. And we established 30 ground. And as many of you know, famously, in good Marine Corps fashion, the order was given to go north and take it to the enemy that went over the 38th parallel, got over, said it, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, I'm going to focus in on Colonel Chesty Fuller and one regiment of the Marines that murdered me. As many of you know, that were surrounded at the famous uh, Chosen Reservoir. How many of you remember the Frozen Chosen, right? Hoorah. Hoorah. And what I want to bring out here, though, gentlemen, is when this happened, when the Marines got overextended, and the Chinese engaged, which was what Washington, D.C. feared. Uh, the Chinese engaged, and they did. They were surrounded by as many, at least 10 divisions of Chinese. You know, one regiment of Marines under Colonel Chesty Buller, later to be Lieutenant General Chesty Buller. Every Marine knows Chesty. How many of you remember Marines in boot camp? The last words every Marine says is, Good night, Chesty, wherever you are. The wire comes in from headquarters when Colonel Bowler sends a wire. We need help. We need, we're running out of everything. We're surrounded. Guys, remember, this is no, November in North Korea. It's frigid. It's below zero. You're running out of supplies. You're running out of everything. And the wire comes back. Gentlemen, we can't help you. We can't get anything to you. And basically, gentlemen, they were, as a matter of history, they were written off. You guys are history. And something happened, guys. No, now, now I've got to keep this G-rated when I talk about Colonel Polo's response. Because <laughs> we're in the church. <laughs> but Colonel Polo, you probably read a few different things uh, that, that Colonel Polo said if you've read about this incredible undertaking. Colonel Buller went, and, and, and I should gloss over this because, folks, this was a time of darkness. I mean, these men were exhausted, hungry, freezing. Some of them would be frosted. And the wire comes in. There's, no, there's nothing coming. You guys are going to have to hold out. And you better believe morale was through the floor. Anybody ever felt like that? Morale was through the floor. But it took one man, Colonel Chesney Fuller, who his, his return wire was, a couple of things I'll, I'll bring out here and we'll keep it G-rated. He 
said. The enemy will not get away from us this time. <laughs> he said, works to the effect of, I can bring for heaven. Are you kidding me? I'm surrounded by the enemy. Any direction I shoot, I hit them. <laughs> and what he did was, with his leadership, he rallied these Marines to do what looked like was impossible to be done. And he shocked the world when, as, as Colonel Polo said, we're not retreating, we're fighting in a different direction. Because there's nowhere to retreat when you're surrounded by 10 divisions of Chinese. And my, my brothers, they, as we said in the Marine Corps, they took some names on their way back over the 38th parallel and were able to reestablish that 38th parallel. And, and my friends, listen, the reason why they did what appeared to be impossible. And, and I am, I'm a, somewhat of a student of, of military history. And what, what you find in military history are great men who rise to the occasion when there are times of utter darkness and despair. And you know what you find out is virtually every one of them are theists. You said, you know, we've heard the old thing, there's, there's there's no atheist in Boxhole so There's a few, all right? <laughs> but you're, you're going to find even fewer among the great ones. Well, you know, I'm not saying they have good Catholic theology. You know, General Patton has some crazy ideas of reincarnation. But they have a profound belief in God. And they understood, they understand that they are involved with something that is much bigger than themselves. And there is a calling. And there is a belief that if we unify together and we get on our knees as George Washington in the famous painting on his knees, praying in, in the snow, God can empower us to do the impossible. Gentlemen, this is what we need today. We need a few good men. You know, it's not just the Marine Corps looking for a few good men. Amen. God is looking for a few good men who understand the gravity of this situation and are willing to say with Isaiah the prophet, Here am I, send me. But see, here now, that was the introduction. Are you all ready for the talk? <laughs> but see, here's the problem, gentlemen. The problem is before we can be Colonel Chesney Moore, or better, Isaiah the prophet, we need to see the Lord. And we need to see situation in which we find ourselves. You all know the story of Isaiah, the prophet who was praying in the Lord in, in, in the temple. And he sees the Lord. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, very right, strength filled the temple. And when he sees God, what does he say? I, I love the first words out of Isaiah's mouth. When he sees the Lord, what does he say? Whoa! Right? Whoa is me. Prophets are good at saying, whoa unto me. Amen. Whoa. Woe is a word, of course, that speaks of judgment, the judgment of God. Woe, prophets were good then. Woe unto thee, woe unto thee. But Isaiah sees the Lord, and what does he say? Woe is me. For I am literally, in Hebrew, it's, I am flying apart. Right? I am undone, as one translation says. And he sees his inadequacy, inadequacy before the, this holy God, and God calls him as new, you know, he touches his lips with coals from the altar, purifying him, and he sends him out to change the world. And then some 2,700 years later, we're still talking about Isaiah. Amen? Amen. Amen. See, he saw the Lord saying, here's the problem, gentlemen. First point. I believe one of the problems we have in our culture is we have created a cultural Jesus. That how, how shall I put this? You've, you've heard of the Jesus history of history versus the Christ of faith. That's more marky. They're the same Jesus. Can I just say it? Okay, yeah, amen. They're the same. Hey, I, I want to talk about the Jesus of Scripture versus the Jesus of popular Christian culture for a few, few moments. See, we've got to see. Gentlemen, if we're going to see the urgency of the situation in which we find ourselves, it's got to begin with Jesus. It's got, it's got to begin with a real picture of our Lord and Savior. And this is how I'm going to do it. 
I'm going to go to the scriptures here, and we'll start at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. And let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Amen? Amen. Amen. As my Pentecostal preacher friends would say, let's talk about Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, a man comes up to Jesus. Man, this is Al, this is a Pentecostal preacher's dream. Man comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go. My goodness, as a Pentecostal, I said, brother, sit down right here. We'll say the sinner's prayer and get you your tithing envelopes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? Obviously, Jesus had never been to a Billy Graham crusade. Because <laughs> he got it wrong. Jesus got it wrong. He didn't tell him to force spiritual laws and lead him in the sinner's prayer. <coughs> what did he say? Here's a man. I want to follow Jesus. And he said, oh, yeah. Foxes have holes, birds have their nests. The Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. Oh, my goodness. Y'all, Jesus, you need to win. You need to read the book out of win, friends, and influence people. <laughs> Some zealots that were saying, come on, let's get some swords. We're going to rise up. It's time, brother. We're going to take the 
empire, right? There was no doubt there was a little bit. But notice what Jesus says. He says, do you think those men were sinners above all other Galileans? Does this happen to you? He said, no. I say to you, they weren't. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Jesus needs sensitivity training. <laughs>
culture that we lost. We are left out of the conversation in our culture today because we've got to earn our way back in. And the way you do that, my friends, is not with eloquence of speech, as St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but in demonstration of the power of the Spirit. We need men with transformed lives who see Jesus, see the call, and say, Lord, here am I, send me, transform me, because we need witnesses. We used to say, can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. We need witnesses. We need Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, no. That's <laughs> we need witnesses. We need men who are sold out for Jesus. And that, that's Paul, the sixth point in paragraph 21. The evangelizer must first be evangelized. We must be transformed. We must be first. But I'm going to leave you with this in paragraph 22. And I'm going to urge you, brothers. My last words to you are, stop abusing St. Francis of Assisi. Stop it. Said, oh. Some of y'all y'all were cartoon characters. You had a big question mark over your head, right? Y'all know the state, right? St. Francis, by the way, I've never been able to find that he actually said this. But let's just say he did. Or I'm still looking for it. But St. Francis, said, preach the gospel, use words when necessary. Oh my goodness, I hear that. Ad nauseum. Why? Because you use it as an excuse not to share the gospel. Stop it. Amen? Yes, not. If he did say it, what he is emphasizing is this. Your life must be. First, bear witness to the message or the message will be heard. That is what he's emphasizing in a profound way. And of course that is true. That is powerfully true. But what Pope Paul VI said in paragraph 22, and St. Francis is, is dancing in spirit, saying, Amen, brother, up in heaven. All right? <laughs> Pope Paul VI said this, no matter how good your witness is, it will never, let me quote him, it will always be insufficient. Because ultimately the witness leads people to ask questions. Why? And we must be prepared in Pope Paul the 6th paragraph 22, quotes 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts always and be ready to give everyone an answer, a reason, an apologia, apologia in Greek. That's where apologetics comes from. A reason for the hope that lies within you and do it with meekness and with respect. Gentlemen, it's not enough for us, although my friends, we need to begin this weekend on our knees in the confessional. We need to begin there. We need to transform lives, but that is not enough. We are notoriously ignorant when it comes to our Catholic faith. We have become famous for being ignorant. We joke about how we are ignorant of the Bible. We don't know Scripture. We joke about it. My friends, that's disgraceful. We as Catholics need to be the Jesus people. We need to be the ones that they see on the bicycles and go, oh, here come the Catholics. <laughs> Absolutely powerless to be able to accomplish 
that to which we are called. There is nowhere else to look but in the same direction as those men under Colonel Chester Fuller in 1950 looked. They looked to God. They prayed. Those men were on their knees begging God to aid them to do what it looked like it was impossible to do. And I will guarantee you, gentlemen, when we reach that point, we will do what looks like it is impossible that we can do. We have done it before. We faced a Roman Empire that was a lot more ominous than the Obama administration. And we transformed it from the inside out. We went from Diocletian, who was determined to destroy Christianity, to kill the Pope and destroy the scriptures, and take Christianity out. Sixty years later, the empire was Christian. Amen? Amen. So don't tell me about this Obama garbage. We need to talk about us. As Kimberly Long said, if you want the real wisdom in that household, then <laughs> Some of you know exactly what you've left, and you know what you need to get to. And some of you are being called to do more.